Good morning and welcome to our live talk program. This is Lloyd Grubb here, your host on Revive Reform Radio, doing our live talk program covering current events on this year, Thursday morning, Rise and Shine. And this morning here, we're looking at a topic, disconnecting or disconnection between life and Bible, um, resulting in the youth exodus. This is our topic for this morning here, the disconnection between life and Bible and how it results in a youth exodus um, from the church. So welcome again. Hopefully you had some sleep last night and you're ready to take on the day. May God bless you and thanks for joining me here. Let us pray. Father, word in heaven, I'm thankful, dear Lord, for life, for liberty, and for the clarity of mind that you give us. I pray, dear Lord, you may bless us by thy word. May thy spirit go with us as we look into these things and as I share these things with those here that are listening. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um... There was a uh, there was a, a report or, or a survey that came back or came in, I think yesterday or the day before, um, done by this group called Lifeway, and um, it um, reviewed uh, why young people are leaving the church at a certain age. I think between sixteen um, to early twenties, and I wanted to cover that this morning. I want to um, look at it and analyze it from um my perspective how i view life how i see um what's going on in the church and so i want to share with you that article here this morning and it's an article that you probably see young adults are dropping out of the church in large numbers so this is this study that was done by lifeway and i think they're part of the southern baptist convention and so my topic um to cover where I'm going with it is the disconnection. So my conclusion why young people leave is there's a disconnection between life and the Bible or what is taught in the Bible, what is taught in the pulpit. So um, there's a disconnect and yet it and so it end up in a youth exodus. And um, so I want to look at that the age group is 18 through 22. So that's what I want to talk about here. This is my conclusion and when you, I share with you the article you'll see the logical conclusion. So um, there's always a disconnect. So if you've, you know, you, most of you, you go to church, you're familiar with religion, you're here listening to me, I'm assuming. So church often is disconnected from reality. When you think about most churches, and you think about the sermons that are preached, the way church is done, that most of the focus is on miracles, prayer, worship. But little is on the practical teachings of the Bible. And I think um, it set up young people to not be prepared for the challenges of life. And the moment they start to deal with the challenges of life's life, it kind of threw them out because they were not prepared for the arguments out there. They're not prepared for the challenges that they're going to have to face and the real world because they're told for years, imagine from 1 to 18, you're told, it's all about grace, prayer, miracle. And life is going to come with some challenges that is going to unsettle your fate. I think I covered a few months back about this singer who basically lost her faith. And why? Because prayers were going up, but the blessings were not coming down um, in the lives of the people that she was around. And she started to shake her fate. I've shared with you here that there's been many even pastors who... Um, I remember this pastor told the story that the first time he went to a hospital and anointed somebody and prayed, they got healed. And he thought he was a healer. And then he started to go and anoint more people. And after that, every single person he anointed died. And so after a while, he started thinking people were afraid of him. Because when he came in to anoint, they thought that person was going to die. So there is this idea here that you focus on that, but you never focus on the practicality. And when young people go into the world, they're going to face with a world that they're unprepared for, they weren't told about. It's almost like it was hid because of what many churches do. So um, so little focus on practicality and hence church after a while become irrelevant because it doesn't have the value to the life of the young person. And in general, in all aspects of their life and the challenges that they're going to face, there's no solution because the solution is often just pray. God will work a miracle. And when a miracle doesn't come, it can shake one fate because life is drawn in them. 
or people hit them with hard questions and there's no answer for it because nobody ever tried to even deal with the answer they dismissed the question so there's no answer to be wrestled with wrestled for so this is what i'm going to cover this morning here and i'm going to go ahead and read one text and then i'm going to go straight to the um reading another thing i might say before i read this text is that another big reality that often can be missed is that the reality that many are waiting to exhale in other words uh, the young persons in the church, another large percentage of young people that leave the church after 18. They're in the church, but they're waiting. They're holding their breath. And they're holding their breaths and they're waiting to go ah, and get out there and go live that worldly life. They're just there buying time. And the moment they get out, they bust hell wide open. They're just being restrained. So that's another big issue that often is not covered. It's not the obvious one, most naturally. But there's other reasons, and so the are they going to deal with some of the many reasons? But a big reason is that there's young people are there just buying time. They're like, man, I can't, I can't take being here because today I want to go and do things that I'm being restricted. In Psalms 119, verse 103 through 105, Psalms 119, verse 103 through 105 says, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This is the statement of David in Psalms 119. If a young person has a type of statement like this, they're not going to be in a rush to run into the world and to stop going to church. The word has value. But you can see the attitude of most young people. It is not surprising. Uh, their attitude towards the word is like, yeah, I could pass. <laughs> I could pass on that. And they're unprepared. So if the word is being given, you could have a situation where the word is being given, it's being made practical. But a young person is like, I, I don't even want to hear because I just want to go out there and live a sinner's lifestyle. So if you look at now the article, I'm going to share the article with you again. And this is in various different places, Christian Post and so forth. But I put it here from USA Today. So young adults are dropping out of church in large numbers, survey finds. This is why, um, so this is why, they're going to give the reason why. So this is taken here, uh, I start. Large number of young, young adults are frequent, um, who frequently attend protestant worship services in high school are dropping out of church. Two-thirds of young people say they stopped regular regularly going to church for at least a year between the age of 18 and and 22 a new life wave research survey shows that means that uh, that means the church had a chance to share its message and value of attending with this group but it didn't stick says scott mcconnell executive director of life we research that's a lot of folks saying, no, that's not for me, or it's not for me right now at that young age, McConnell, McConnell says, said. Life Race Research um, released its student dropout survey on Tuesday. Nashville-based entity um, interviewed 2002 U.S. adults ages 23 to 30 who attended a Protestant church two times or more a month for at least a year in high school. The interviews were conducted from September 15 to October 13, 2017. Lifeway Research is a ministry of Lifeway Christian Resources, which is a publishing arm of the Southern Baptist Convention. So this would include, I guess, if they did their main base, but it's Protestant, they say, so I'm assuming it's all over. But this would be um, primary evangelicals. Um, the high dropout um, did not surprise Pastor Chris Brooks, who leads the Karos Congregation at Brentwood Baptist Church in Brentwood, Tennessee. The majority of these, who, those who attend uh, a Karos Tuesday night service, are between the ages of 22 and 29. There is a substantial amount of people in this age demographic who, for whatever reason, decide that the church is no longer integral to building their faith 
or their fate is no longer integral to them. He loves young adults. They are selfish, but also still trying to figure out who they are and what they want to do, Brooke said. It leads to lively and challenging discussion at church, which he welcomes. It identifies the purpose which are common theme throughout the Bible, Brooks says, and they become aware of do they like the God that they were given um, growing up? Why young people? Um, so here's some of the numbers now. The 66% who said they stop attending church regularly as young adults cite a variety of reasons for leaving. The survey lists 55 um, and the survey listed 55 and asked them to pick all that applied. On average, they choose seven or eight reasons, McConnell says. The reason fell under four categories. Nearly all, 96%, cited life changes, including moving to college and work responsibilities that prevented them from attending. 73% said church or pastor-related reasons led them to leave. Of those, 32% said church members seem judgmental or hypocritical, and 29% said they did not feel connected to others who attended. 70% named religious, religious, ethical, and political beliefs for dropping out. Of those, 25% said they disagree with the church's stance on political or social issues, while 22% said they were only attending to please someone else. And 63% said the students and youth ministry reasons contributed to the, their decisions not to go. Of those, 23% said they never connected with the students in the student ministry. And 20% said the student seems judgmental or hypocritical. Uh, we are tapping, and that's the end of that summary part there, we are tapping into a lot of different feelings and logistics, um, logistical things as well, says McConnell, pointing out that this age group is often in a time of transition, but, le but leaving was not an intentional decision for many. Of those who dropped out, 71% said they did not plan on it. A statistic like that says, Wow, we need to help those young people plan ahead, McConnell said. More, um, so more, uh, sorry, let me see that. Um, so Americans, uh, so here, Christian church still struggle with race, how to discuss it and what to do. Those who left are not out of reach, expert says. And um, And so let me, Go to the last part here. So McKinnell does not think those who have left between age 18 to 22 are out of church reach forever. When the 66% who said they left pick reasons for leaving, only 10% said they drop out because they stopped believing in God. So that was not the main reason. Some who stopped attending church had already returned. At the time of the survey interview, 31% of those who had dropped out as young adults said they were currently attending twice a month or more. 39% said they were attending a church once a month or less. And 29% were not going at all. Um, I'm... I think the church should continue to reach out to them and be sharing the news of the gospel to have relations um, with God, but also to have relations with the church. For many of these young people, they, have completely re they haven't completely rejected the church. They may just be attending less or think and thinking that's okay. So that's the end of that article there. Just got a little piece out. So here... Um, here, you know, you get a little kind of an overview. Um, and I, as I say, I read it like another place so I can get another analysis of what is being put forward here by Lifeway. So my focus, though, is is kind of taken right from the article, which is a disconnection between life and Bible. So if you've been, as I say, if a person been 18 years in a church from birth, just talking about those who were been there from birth, and... Um, 
they're not prepared for life. When the challenges of life come, it can blow you out or suck you out. So even though a small percentage say they stop believing God. So those are those that are like, I don't believe in God and more out. So that's a small percentage, only 10%, I think the article said, that said that. So that's aside. You know, as I say, there's some people who they're leaving because they plan to leave. You know, they, they're those. They're not the majority, I believe. I believe some people, you know, people, they're thinking, look, the moment I reach a certain age, I'm out of here. I'm planning to. But notice this is a large percent of them. I think it was 90% or so didn't have no plan or some number like that. Um, it, it, okay, you know, it was 71%. So it says of those who dropped out, 71% said they did not plan to leave. So that means if there's 10 kids in a church and they're all 18, um, there's a possibility that three, they already plan to leave. So they, they, they're just waiting for the time. They don't want to hear anything. They probably shrug their shoulder, look depressed when it's time for any services. They're like, they were dragged there. That's 30%, 29%. So out of the rest, um, they just didn't plan. It just happened. And so this is where I think um, the connection, because I'm often in church and not just now, even when I was younger and I was in that age group. And I would think going from church to church where the church is hot or cold or lukewarm, that um, often what is being said and what is being done is not pre prepping me for life. I'm not talking about prepping me per se to come back because they tell me I need to come back to pray and to listen to a sermon and so forth. But I, I didn't feel then that I was being prepped for life and prepped for the challenges of life and prepped for the challenges of my faith. There were times when I'd hear a very good ser seminar or something and I think, yeah, that gave me some answers. And then other times it was just nothing. It's just nothing. Practical. So because of that, if I'm not prepped for what is coming, when it comes... I don't have to plan to leave. I'll just leave by by natural processes. I'll just leave because I'm slowly being pulled out. And also if the church has no great relevance for pr practical life, I will leave and not thinking too much about it. Because when I look back at often what was going on, you could be in a church and a church not holding no young people. And you're there as a young person and you realize something is wrong because the way, whether it be the sermon is done, the way church is done, it is not done with a connection with the world outside or with what's going on in the church. We got their problems and stuff happening in the church and the, the lives of the members. And everybody's talking about it as if everybody's good. I used to be so impressed. I'm still impressed because I'll watch services sometime, looking for something, come up on a service, click watch. And I'm fascinated because the way the pastor is preaching I would think this is a perfect church. If the pastor is saying from his sir, sir pulpit, which was something I was watching, I think, last year, that the biggest challenges, he didn't say it, but he was communicating challenges that people have to deal with. And challenges is just getting up in the morning and get to work, which is a challenge. But if I'm thinking in this life where people having all kind of problems with their children, having problem with, you know, with mental health problems, STDs, you know, financial problem. And if the biggest problem you have is just getting up and going to work, life must be good, it must be a good experience. So if you look at this, and uh, you look at the statistic um, here, we find that um, I'm going to look at the main chunk here now. So the four sections that it was broken down. Notice here it says 96%, again, I'm going to read it again, 96% cited life changes included moving to college work responsibility that prevented them from attending right so just the cares of this world so to me that's where again if if i know that somebody's going to leave and a percentage or that i said a person that's going to leave um but they didn't plan to i know that most 96 percent are going to cite as one of the reasons they left is the pressures of life. You know, the work study balance, the work study church life balance. Then we're gonna have to talk about that. The 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 the, the youth ministry or the preaching are gonna have to switch and start talking about that. The seminars are gonna have to switch and start talking about, especially for that age group, 
those responsibilities? What are you going to do with work? What happened? What are you going to do with the pressures of life? Because remember, upon this that till this point, the child is on the parent's dole. The parent is taking care, housing the child, feeding the child. And many parents sometimes to me are guilty in this because the child um, doesn't deal with life as if their job is their schooling. But outside of schooling, they have other responsibilities. So the parents want the child to just do school, nothing else. And so the pressures of life is not really being hit in the child. And I think every child as they get older, uh, they're being, they should be weaned off that type of stuff. So that the child knows the dishes to be washed, the garbage to take out. There's responsibility outside of school because the child is being prepped for life. But somebody who said, no, the child is being prepped to get a good grade. But so many people have crashed and burned in this life. Getting great grades, um, achieving the highest levels of education. But they were not prepared for that in life. And so, they, yeah, they go into the workforce, but all they can do is go to work. They have no practical use outside of work and their marriages fail. Their whole personal life fail, everything fail, but they can function at work, so to speak, because they even fail at that. They keep up to switching jobs. So this is where I say the practical connection between life and the Bible is often missed because the practical parts, parts of the Bible is kind of ignored for whatever the bent of the preacher. The preacher is just focused on motivation then that's how the preacher preach. And it becomes a motivational talk all the time. If the preacher is bent on prophecy, that's all he talks about. If he bent on the grace of God, that's all he talks about. But the parts in the Bible that has to do with cause and effect, practical sensibilities, financial sensibilities, relationships, a lot of that is just ignored. And what ends up happening, the person is not prepared to deal with the struggles of life person is not prepared to deal with the pressures and so when the pressures come the person is shocked because their parent cuddled them and powdered them and lotioned them and basically feed spoon feed them and so they constantly hover over them and now the child is 18 and the child is basically a big baby and the parent think they did good because you know they talk about the bubble wrap the bubble wrap generation where these kids are bubble wrapped. And so when they go into life now, the work beat them up, the school beat them up, um, their friends beat them up, everything is beating them up, and they depress. And you see this This is especially so true for this generation, very depressed, because their parents are bubble wrapped them and protect them, and they constantly deal with them as if they are like a puppy. Not good. So they cite life changes, including college, work, responsibility, and so forth. It's so much, again, I'm noticing so many churches, they talk about the cross. But the person they're talking to, they're not ready to bear nothing. And so they're not able to bear the pressures of life. You see, the cross of Christ make you tough. And this is just the reality. Now, notice here again, the next big point here. So a large percentage side life challenges. The next section here is 70 Three percent. Um, I remember each in this study they had fifty something different points, and most people I think choose six to eight points. So this is where the overlaps comes in. So seventy three percent said church or pastor related reasons led to them um, led to them to leave or led them to leave. Of those, thirty two percent said church members seem judgmental or hypocritical, and twenty nine percent of um, said they did not feel connected to others who attend. So let's take these two sections here. 32% said church members seem judgmental and hypocritical. Uh, this can be true to one degree or to the other, to the left or to the right. Because, again, when you're in church, people can be very judgmental. They can be very harsh. You know, they can not be as uh, merciful, knowing that many times things that people do. Well, number one, we are sinners. And then the other thing is that we all make mistakes. And we all even make bad choices, especially when you're younger. You can make such terrible blunders. Uh, because you can be either hell-bent or naive. 
between those two, most of our mess mess up that we do when we're younger and even older are this. Um, church people can be very hypocritical also. And you can see this being displayed in so many different ways. And who picks this up mostly, um, either the judgmental or hypocritical, is a young person because often they're not as committed and they're not playing the game because they're trying to be what they're trying to be. Or they're not being anything, they're being quiet and watching what's going on. And they can see the hypocr hypocrisy very quickly. And to me, that was my experience. I mean, I'm still here, but that was my experience. You see it and you're like, man, this is a mess. But also the flip of that is young people themselves can have a naive view of life and an immature view of life. And there's things that an older person could make a stand on or could seem, it could seem hypocritical. The flip of it could seem hypocritical, and it's not. You see, there's things that a person would go berserk over, and I would see as young, and I could think, why are they acting like that? But as I get older, and I see the long term effect of certain bad decision, I could see why a person becomes very aggressive against certain behavior. And what could have been seen as judgmental or hypocritical is not viewed that way because the immaturity is off. So I think it can go both ways. And I've seen it happen both ways. You know, there's people who, I never even deal with people, there's people who are adults and you can make a moral judgment or a decision because their number one catchphrase is that we shouldn't judge. I'm sure you've dealt with adults like that. They love that word. Love it. And they've taught young people, oh, don't judge, don't judge, don't judge. Oh, you don't know the person's heart. You don't know the person's heart. They're like, this is their national anthem. They wake up every morning, and the first thing on the bed, they start singing, don't judge, don't judge, don't judge. You don't know the people are. You know the people are. And they, they live their life like that. And what a mess. What a mess. So because a person leave the church and say the church people are judgmental, it doesn't mean that when they leave the church, they're going to do better and they're not going to get bounced up. And it doesn't mean that they're not going to have to form their own opinions because what they could think as judgmental, when they get older, after they've been scammed and rammed and beaten and pushed and stepped upon in life, they start to, have, they start to become judgmental. I remember this person, he was a secular person and they were, they were, they said when they were younger, they were quite liberal in their views. And he said, um, he said when he was younger, he was quite liberal in his views. He used to view, um, you know, like people incarcerated as being, they need a better chance, they need, you know, all this type of stuff. Need more mercy to them and so forth. And he says, one day he got, he got um, basically, I think he got, he, yeah, definitely got robbed by a gunpoint. And I can't remember if it was pistol whipped. And he said it changed his views because although he still believes as an adult now, he's older, that um, they need more re rehabilitation and opportunities. He, st he said he's not believed that you got to incarcerate somebody like that. Can't allow them to be going around and robbing people, shooting them, and pistol whipping them, and stuff like that. He said, even though he understand that they came from the ghetto, and they came from this, and they came from that. And that sometimes, and so he says, he more, he's still on the liberal side, but he more lean conservative. In other words, I believe life is more fluid than um, you can think it is when you were young. Because again, even though the person was messed up by a system, it still means that they're messed up. It doesn't mean that because they're messed up now, I need to take them and I need to say, oh, come little puppy, let me, you know, cuddle you or whatever. And then they snap at me and bite me. I seem to be careful. But when you're young, you can take in very black and white terms and be very idealistic. It doesn't mean that because we believe that there should be equality and all that type of stuff. One thing doesn't translate into other as you get older. So this is a trick, and I've seen it, and this is why I say evil discussions like this need to be had with young people. Because especially, think about Lifeway belonging to the Southern Baptist Convention. Churches like this, they have a certain political lean and certain political views that not necessarily going to prepare you for life, but it's going to prepare you to worship. 
for whatever that is, but I'm prepared for life. And life, you know, can change real drastically. The next point there in the second section is 29% said they did not feel connected to others who attend. And that can be true and that can be another thing that is flipped. Uh, many times, as I say, if you're in a church and you're there just waiting to exhale, you're not going to connect. And you're there because you didn't, you didn't, you didn't, you're there because you're brought there. You're not there because you choose to be there. So this is an age group that is very is funny, it's difficult to deal with because the person is not there by choice, they're there by um, process of my parents are here, so I'm here. Or my friends are here, so I'm here. I don't want to be here. It's not, it's, that I, it's, that I, it's not that I want to be here or not want to be here. It's just I'm here. The motivation is not there. So the connection is not there. I remember years back, I, I was at church and um. You know, there's a young lady at the church. Uh, you know, I'm older, so I'm married and all. I've, you know, this is not too far ago. There's a long, young lady at the church. The mother brought a young lady. I'm trying to talk to the young lady, and she's ignoring me, not smiling with me, not nothing. She comes again. Hi, how are you doing? Barely say hi. So forth and so on. So I'm like, what's going on? I didn't understand until later on, somebody told me, oh, that she's a lesbian and that would be why the cold shoulder. So if it's it's a it's a tricky thing because it's again if I knew that it would make a difference to me, I'd be i would be still high and friendly. What's the big deal? That's just your your choice in life. Um it, that wouldn't be my choice, but I can deal with you with respect and and treat you with dignity and all that. That's on me, that's not on you. But the person just gave me a cold shoulder and um and it's like nobody was gonna eat you. We all sinners saved by grace, so I understand. But that's where the, the thing is sometimes you're dealing with a young person, which I say the other twenty nine percent, and they don't wanna be there. I don't wanna be there, they have an attitude, they're on their phones, they're ignoring they, they, if anything is said, they quickly take it out of context because they're looking for an excuse. I remember I was at this church and um, the pastor came and said, you know, this young girl said something was, you know, this young girl was at a church the week before. And the pastor came and he says, you know, this person says she don't want to be back at the church because something was said. So what was said? And he, he said it. It was something simple. It's something that could be interpreted either way. It wasn't anything judgmental or anything like that. Um, so I was about to answer and say, wow, that's kind of strange. And the pastor said, oh, don't worry about it. You, you know, in ministry, you're always going to deal with that. There's always going to be a young person come in. And, oh, as a matter of fact, the person had come there because their mother was in town. And so they had to go to church. And so they went to church, but they found an excuse not to go back after the mother, mother left. That's the rest of the story. So he said, don't worry about it. it. It's like, I'm telling you something. It's, that's the reality. You're going to always have young people. They don't want to be there and they come almost looking for excuse. And the moment they get one, they snatch onto it. And that's their excuse never to come back because they want to go out. And that's just the reality I've learned. It is very tricky because, as I say, um, when you choose something for your own, it's different than when somebody chooses it for you. Because that's not your choice. I'm sure you have people in your life, especially family, that you'll find really quickly. That you can have friends that are closer to you than family. Why? Because you don't choose your family, but you choose your friends. It's different because your friends are people you come in contact with one way or the other. And then you connect with them and you stay connected. And you choose to connect. With church, most of the time, is I choose the church. The church chooses me. I might not want to be there. So 29% said they did not feel connected to others who attend. That can be very tricky. Very tricky because you could be connected to people at your school and not connected to people at your church because they're not your friends. That's not your choice. Those are the people you would connect with. Again, and sometimes if you have a whole bunch of young people, a large percent of them is acting in the hour. They're hypocrites because they're just acting until they get out. And when they get out, they're going to do their real life and live their, their true self. 
it can be very, you know, as I say, I've been in a situation where there's a whole bunch of young people waiting to basically put on a frock. They're a young guy, but they're going to put on a frock when they leave church. So they're not there. They're not happy. They're just there until it's time for them to leave. They might not even plan, but they're not going to stay. Uh, next section there is 70% name religious, ethical, or political belief for dropping out. Of those, 25% said they disagreed with the church stance on political or social issues, while 22% said they were only attending to please someone else. So firstly there, 25% say they disagree with the church's stance on political and social issues. Um, think about that. We live in a world where um, so much of this is true, right? The church sometimes don't have a stance or they have a very clear stance. I've belonged to churches which they were had a clear stance on anything that was foreign was of the devil. Very clear stance. And very anti-stance. They would want America to be homogenous. Uh, I think I messed that one up. Um, to be one. So that means, they, you know, you so imagine you're in a church. And they see you. They're happy to see you on the surface. But then when you talk to them politically, they say, we would prefer just to have whites in the country. What did it tell you? You shouldn't even be here. So I've experienced that. So what that would do, that would be like, so what if you're one of them? You could be like, I don't like the stance of the church. I'm out of here. Political stance. Again, think about this was done um, by a group in Tennessee. Think about their views in many of these churches. They have some very straightforward political view that is anti-anything foreign, anything poor, anything so forth and so on. So you can see why they would disagree on the church stance. They're pro-war. They're anti-anything to do with nature. Imagine you have so many young people where they go off to college. They're off to college in a more liberal area where um, it is pro-LBGTQ. It's pro-taking care of nature. It's pro-more liberal leading philosophy and ideology. And they go back to their church and the church is preaching um, no global warming, you know, destroy the earth, drill baby drill, fight baby fight. Imagine all that. It, that would be like a whirlwind. And, you know, so they go off to college is one thing. They go come back home is another thing. Total disconnect on the political social issues. And I think that's a big one because, again, most of the time college and the world outside lives is totally different. Colleges are mostly in the north, northeast. Um, the big colleges especially. Or if they're in down south, they're in towns that are leaning liberal. Because a lot of those colleges, they're close to a city area. And a more genteel location. So you imagine you're going to a church and they're playing with snakes. And they go to a place and they're, you know, they're just more on the intellectual side. You would have a big disconnect. 22% said they were only attending to please someone else. So when you start parsing those numbers, you sort of see that the 31% of those who were planning to leave probably is higher. Because if I'm in a church, and I'm in a church, and you say the first one is a, is a toss-up. I'm not prepared for life challenges. But I'm in a church, and I think the, judge, the members are judgmental, 32%. And then 29% say I'm not connected with those who attended. And then 25% say they not they don't believe in the political or social issues that the church preaches. And then 22% of that, again, say that they're going because somebody dragging them there. You start to realize that even at 29% say they didn't plan to leave. Really plan to leave, but it's psychologically in, the, in their subconscious. Because if I start to disagree and can't connect and don't believe in that and I don't connect with what the pastor's preaching or the members stand for ethically, I might not ever thought about it and say, am I ever coming back to this church? But technically, in the back of my head, I ain't coming back. So I think that lar that number is larger on a, on, a, on a subconscious level. It's larger. You know, if you belong to a group and you... You decide that you don't like everything about the group. You don't like the people. You don't connect with the people. You don't believe in their political stance. You don't believe in their moral stance. You believe they're judgmental, blah, blah, blah. 
you just really said to me, you're not going back. Now, somebody could argue and say, no, no, they're not. They're young. They're not thinking it all the way through. Technically, what they say, not going back. And even though they say some will come back, why I believe some will come back? Because life is not what it's made out to be on the other side. In other words, you're going to do some of these areas, what they will call the liberal bastions across the United States, where these colleges at and they're free thinking. And then you realize real quickly, they're not as free as they think. And they too don't connect with life. They too is in a bubble. And those bubbles get burst, pop, 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 all the time. Because their philosophies don't connect with reality. Like I was covering yesterday, and I kind of go off a little bit towards the end, but somebody tell me they believe in evolution. That's a nonsense. You know, it's just stupidity. It's just, you know, I used to be able to, I used to do, and I will do in the future, seminars on evolution, but I'll try not to even talk about it because it's just a bunch of nonsense. It doesn't work. The principle doesn't make sense. What evolution is, is basically supporting barbarism, supporting barbaric behavior with a philosophy. It's telling people they can murder and rape little children and say that they're the, they're the fittest. So you don't accept it. And so that it doesn't work it out there. So they go out there and get beaten up and then they come back to the church because real quickly life fall apart for them. And they need some Jesus and they need some grace. The fourth section there says 63% said students, youth ministry reasons contribute to their decision not to go. I believe in this one heartily. Uh, I think youth pastors are the pits. I don't know what's the point of it. Um, of those, 23% said they never connected with students in student ministry. And 20% said the students seem judgmental and hypocritical. So just imagine a whole bunch of them keep saying the students seem judgmental and hypocritical. <laughs> so just imagine I'm in a student group and I'm looking across the room at my friend John. Who is in the group. Not my friend, but the person is in the room with me. And I'm looking at him to the side of my head. I lean my head to the side, look at him and say, man, that's a hypocrite. <laughs> and then he look over at me and say, man, that's a hypocrite. We two of us are hypocrites <laughs> in a hypocritical group looking at each other. Because me know and I, he, two of us know that we ain't, the moment we reach 18 and we finish high school, we bouncing. But while we're in the group, oh yeah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. <laughs> we're going along with the show. <laughs> and I'm looking at me thinking, you hypocrite. And he's looking at me thinking, you hypocrite. <laughs> and that's kind of what it is. And then there's the other groups are going to, the other part of the group is going to be judgmental and trying to berate you and tell that you need to repent and all that type of stuff. And you're looking at them as thinking, they're hypocrite too. And um, for somebody who's done, if, you know, somebody could hear me say that and thinking I'm being hypocritical. But, you know, I've done my share of youth ministries. And <laughs> this is how I view it. It's, I view it as a joke. It's um, it's the pits. It is it is a joke. I I tend to stay away from that type of stuff because it has its problem. Uh, because most of the time, what it is is a babysitting um, little rebels. <laughs> they're not interested in anything serious. They're not serious about anything. They're just waiting to exhale. So that's just the problem. And the way they conduct youth ministry is like you're dealing with fools. This is how I see it is that they talk down to the young people. They talk as if they're not experiencing life and they don't know anything. And they keep it very simplistic. Now, I'm not saying that there's no youth ministry out there that is not more mature. But most of the youth ministry, they're entertainment. You know, it's just somewhere to go sing and and to be entertained and to be joked with and to talk to in a very secular, you know, cool way. And is not prepare young people for professional life. That's what I mean. You're not prepared for life challenges. You're more being trained and talked to like you're a bubblehead doll. You're an idiot. And that's how I see youth ministry. So I can see why they never connect with students in the ministry because it's just the way youth ministry is done to me in the country over. So when we look at these type of things here, I see here a breakdown that connect with what my point is. And this is where I got a point, disconnect between life and Bible. And this is creating a youth exodus. And even the ones that come back, they come back and they're teetering because, yeah, they're there, but it's it's not a connection. Because imagine, if your church teach you um, and they teach you this false patriotism, 
it teach you that you follow Jesus, but you don't love the immigrants. You follow Jesus, but you don't love the minorities, the poor. Because as most of those churches stands, they couldn't care less what happened to the poor people in our society. Your church teach you that you can go on a mission trip somewhere in Malawi, somewhere in Niger, somewhere far off, somewhere in Peru, to help the poor. But the poor that live across town, they're going to stay poor. And we're going to make sure we push our Republican candidates to push legislation to keep them poor and to not help them. It's hypo hypocrisy at the highest realm. It's hypocrisy right there in the church. And even if the young people fully don't understand that, they, they know in the subconscious it's hypocrisy and they leave. And that's just the problem with a lot of what's going on in the church. The reasons here are, are phenomenal real because this is the power of a survey, a large group, especially that day incognito they're, they're anonymous so they can say and you can see the numbers and can realize uh, that a lot of what these things have like a youth ministry and stuff like that they're just they're not real okay, they don't deal with real issues real struggles that people are going through so when these young people leave these churches they're unprepared for life think about where the drug et epidemic is hitting and who is hitting is it in young people who are quite religious from religious areas in appalachia and the bible belt it's hitting people in 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 maine and washington who are very secular also so liberalism does not prepare you either it's not like i go to, i'm a young person i was going to a church the church has a very weird stance the church doesn't all it talks about is prayer miracles and um and whatever else that is per se immaterial and it doesn't teach practicality of religion and i leave that and i go to a liberal bastion i go to seattle i go to washington dc i go to san francisco i go to portland maine and i go to you know go to oregon wherever that city is in oregon and i go to these places and i pick up all this liberalism and all of things to find out that the more people embrace that is the more they die of drug up overdose I come back to my local area in Tennessee or in Washington, uh, West Virginia or whatever. And the young people there are dying also, believing in God. One group don't believe or one group believe in it. Both dying. Uh, because both don't prepare for life. You tell me that somebody that believes in evolution is prepared for life. You know, I won't laugh, but I'll feel like I'll cry. Because you're foolish. You're going to get a foolish beat down. But telling me that somebody go to a church that all they talk about is grace, 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 prayer, 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 miracle, 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 that they're prepared for life. They're not. And so many times I've been in churches and I realized the biggest problem is that people fall apart real fast after they assume the helm of their life, after they take over control and they're now sailing their ship and quickly they run their ship to the ground. They run a ship ashore, they run it into reefs. Because they weren't really prepared to take over the helm. Why? Because what was being preached week after week? Prayer, prayer, prayer. Prayer is powerful, but we need to do more than prayer. There is work and pray. And pray and work. Focus on the miracles. God is going to deliver. But there are times, as you know, that you pray, and you ask for deliverance, and God don't deliver. And you see the train wreck happening in slow motion, and you're panicking and you run to the, the controls, try to, you know, stop the train, the train not stopping you. Get on your knees, you pray, and you get up back, the train's still going, and back and forth until your train crash. And that's life, because you're going to suffer some things in life by hard knocks, because you can't learn it the easy way, which is just to receive the word. And something in the young person is not being taught it. And as I said, there's a whole bunch of young people think, oh yeah, they're going to run out there have a bunch of fun and all they're having is some STDs. All they're having is being conned and deceived and whipped and horse dragged through life. And they're beaten up. I meant that you see them later on, they're beaten up, beaten up. Been in so many situations where, I'm, I'm, you know, recently I was preaching and somebody came to me after a sermon, it was a visitor, and say, you know, man, I'm going to tell you, this is my first time in church after 20 something years. So really, yeah. Uh, what was going on all those years? I was in prison. And I recently got out of prison. I was like, man, you recently got up? Yep. So what happened? They let me out because I'm dying of cancer. 
So the person went from young to take over control of their life, to make major blunders, spend most of the rest of their life in prison, and are out to die of cancer. That was it. And you, you say, well, there's two groups in there. That person is either one of the people who didn't listen, didn't want to hear anything, and life is going to whip them. Or another person who the church, the people in the church never prepared them, the pastor never prepared them for life, but they were willing to listen, but they didn't get anything. All they got is just fade, 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 pray, pray, pray. And life going to whip them just the same way. And so there's a disconnect between the practical teachings of life and Bible. And so the youth are leaving, but they're leaving only to find out, A, because you leave, there's no devil. Because think about all these young people today that would tell you, oh, there's no God. It's all fairy tale. It's, it's all you're praying to nothing. But life is hog whipping them. Is there such a thing as a hog whip or a horse whip? I think it's a horse whip. Life is whipping them. They're being dragged through life. And they're dragging. You know, this, you ever seen this thing where somebody's, I don't know if you need to see it, but you can imagine it. They tie a rope to somebody's foot, the ankle, one of the ankle, and then they tie it to a horse, and then they whip the horse, and the horse starts running. And in the movies now, the person is supposed to real quickly grab the rope, pull up to the horse, and get on the horse. But the horse is running, and you can imagine, pure excitement. Normally, the person die, probably get their head decapitated. Not a pretty thought. But that's the sad thing with life, is that life could be dragging you so fast, and you feel like you have a rope tied to your ankle, and you're trying to grab on to that rope are trying to yank the rope to stop the horse and the horse won't stop and you're being dragged to your death and some people they're 18 and they got on the parents house and the moment they got on the parents house somebody tied that rope and that rope is safe heroin or oxycodone oxycontin and that drugs start to pull them and man i'm just hating i'm getting being horse dragged through town and next thing you know what they head get caught in something and they rock it right off. And uh, they get they go from oxycodone to heroin to fentanyl and boom, they head off, done, dead, 18. I used to say, man, that was fast. They just stepped out of the church doors. So it doesn't matter. The, the, what is needed in the church is the preparation. More talk about, don't be fooled. Don't be thinking you're going to run out there and the devil is going to play games with you. The devil love you. The world love you. Because many people believe the world love them and all they're being, do, being is getting whipped by the world. But I think often this lies at the, the, the door of the church. The church is not preparing its young people for the practical difficulties of life. And so the young people thinking, shrug, they're, they're, they're proud. They think, I'm getting out of here. Really? You probably need to get out of that church. You need to go find yourself another church. You need to go find yourself another pastor. You need to go find yourself... Some people that are going to love you and take care of you. Because don't think the world, secular people, because they smile at you and they're nice and they say, oh man, I'm your bro, man, I'm for you. I mean, they're for you. As you know, with the monks, there's no, there's no honor among thieves. But you're going to think, this person here, oh, they don't believe in God, everything like that. They're going to be nice to you. Yeah? Really? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16 says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewithal shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. This is the word of Jesus. You know, this is what fascinated when I read this text. Um, this text can be preached where you only preach the first clause there before the colon. Ye are the salt of the earth. Think about you in a youth group. Most youth groups and stuff, they want to be in a positive. You know, you know some, you know somebody. I think it was Joel Austin, mother, say that people criticize our church, but we just preach the gospel in uh, positively. But there's a problem where Jesus Himself, the author and finisher of our faith, does not preach the gospel only positively. Here is a, one of the most powerful positive statement: "You are the salt of the earth." But right there, Christ basically flipped the situation. He doesn't talk in this type of mumbo jumbo type of fairy tale talk. He give it to you straight, straight as they say. Give it to you raw. 
But we now come as on the shepherds, preachers, and we want to preach the gospel positively. And all that's going to happen is a bunch of negative. But Christ gives the warning there. Notice he adds to it that if you lose your savor, all you're left to be is the trodden on the foot of men. All you're left to is being tied and dragged through town. And many people, that's it. They just get dragged through town. Their stories, their inf infamy, their embarrassments get dragged all around. And all they leave is shame and scars and bruise. And Christ says, be careful, because if you lose your salt, you walk away from truth, the end result is not going to be pretty. This is Jesus speaking. But many people, they're wiser than Jesus. And that's what really got me to start getting into my senses when I realized when people talk this way, Jesus don't talk the way they talk. But yet they're going to say, we preach in Jesus. And I'm thinking, Jesus the Bible don't talk like that. He leaves a little threatening behind his positive preaching notice here yeah the light of the world a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick and they give it light unto all that are in the house let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven this is what we are called to be to be light and salt to preserve and to give men the opportunity to see what is in front of them so they don't walk into a wall. We don't want to have that happen to or fall into a ditch or trip over some obstacle. This is what our lives are supposed to be to others. And often we see so many young people leaving the church and they're tripping. They're walking into walls. They're falling into ditches. And it's simply because they were not given the light so that they become light. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 through 17, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 through 17 says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scripture, which is able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Notice all good works. It's not all, all good just prayer, all good just faith and belief and grace and all that, and mercy, and, but works. What are you doing in life? How is your financial life? How is your marriage life? How is your work ethics? You know, always your social graces. That's what the scripture is given for. To make you be able to have all of this and be a blessing. And not be a mumbling, bumbling wreck. Just crashing and burning. But yet said so you go to church. In Colossians 1 verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. You're not supposed to be like the Gentiles. You're supposed to be light to the Gentiles. In Luke chapter 1, verse 74 through 70 through 80, it says here that he would grant unto us, speaking about John the Baptist, he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. Praise the Lord, that's what we want. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way, to give knowledge to, of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercies of our God, whereby the day spring from on high had visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace, praise the Lord. And the child grew and waxed, waxed strong in the spirit and was in the desert till the day of his showing unto Israel. He wasn't in a comfortable, beautiful you know, palatial place. He was in a rough environment. And he preached a gospel that called people to a serious walk. This is what we need. Serious walk with Jesus. This is what the young people need. So they don't go out there and go crash and burn and make fools of themselves. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, we thank thee. I thank you for your deliverance, for your preserving knowledge and grace that has brought us to this place where we can walk humbly before thee. Bless us, dear Lord. And may we be prepared for all good works. 
This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you as you go to the rest of this day. Thanks for being with me here. Looking forward to talking to you again tomorrow morning where we should talk about wisdom for living. Until then, I pray that you may continue to walk with the King. Mm -hmm.